Hello and welcome again to Digital Profile Art of the Artists. I'm your host, Jazzy Earl. Our channel is dedicated to showcasing artists from the Kansas City area with a unique perspective about them and their work. We hope you will like our channel and if you do, please hit the like and subscribe buttons as well as the bell notification. In today's program, we are going to visit artist Chris Fleck, who enjoys creating portraits and sports murals. Let's take a quick look at some of Chris's work and then spend some time getting to know him and his work. Chris Fleck, C-H-R-I-S, F like Frank, L-E-C-K. Well, my mother kept the first uh, recognizable drawing that I made. And people ask how my career started. I said it started uh, back in the 60s with a, uh, a drawing of a rabbit when I was two years old. And uh, she said, you know, she asked what it was and I told her and she said, I got to looking at it, and, and you're two years old, and it had a head, and it had ears, and she said it just, it, I could tell it was a rabbit. And, you know, I heard the story all my life. Well, not too long ago, I had her dig it out, and uh, she was right. It looked like a rabbit. Since I could hold a crayon, it, it was just, art was what I loved to do. Um, as a kid, and, and this is going to date me, uh, when TV Guide would come in the mail, I would look through it to see, well first I'd check who was on the cover and I'd try and draw, you know, anybody that I liked that was in the TV guide every every week. So uh, that was my first source of, uh, of how to get a likeness. So I would, I would draw off of those photos. And one day we had a visiting artist in, it had to be seventh grade. And so she wanted to look at our work and so I brought this album and hardly any other kid in the art class had an album full of their work. But So I brought this scrapbook and she goes through it and she says, uh, boy, you do a lot of portraits. And I didn't even think about it. It was just what I enjoyed and it's what I thought of when it came to drawing. So that was, that was when I first had a little self-awareness that portraits were my thing. No. Don't, I don't have a preference of medium, but I seem to be doing a lot of oil painting lately. Uh, but when I do a, a mural, it's latex house paint. So um, I also draw caricatures, and that's all in pencil and then uh, permanent marker. And um, so I like a, a variety of media. Um, yeah. I was born and raised in St. Joseph, Missouri, and went away to college to uh, the University of Kansas, which is a whole hour and 10 minutes away, and uh, then came back and got into video. As a kid, I was, um, I mean, I've always been an artist, but also a multi-potentialite. Um, I enjoyed comedy. I enjoyed uh Visual art, uh, music, always had a, a, an aptitude for music. Um, I play harmonica. I've, I've uh, warmed my way in to sit in with some famous people here and there. Um, great trick is to walk into a bar like the Phoenix, ask the band if they have a harmonica player. When they start to apologize, 
because they don't. I say, do you want one? And they say, do you know what you're doing? And I say, well, I have a whole suitcase full of them in the car. And then the next response is usually, go get them. And I do. And, and it's a lot of fun. Um, so I've been in some bands. Um, when I was a kid, I, uh, I did a comedy hour out of our garage. The garage was the theater. And I told all the neighbor kids what to do. And uh, I was kind of the director and one of the stars. And uh, later I went on to, after uh, my divorce, I went on to do some stand-up comedy. I, I had collected notes all my life for things that I thought would be funny or clever. And, uh, and I've always been a stand-up comedy uh, junkie. I've probably seen, well, let me think. Comedy Central has a top 100 uh, outstanding comics, and I have seen 14 or 15 of them live, and a whole bunch of others that have taken off after that list was compiled. And I've met some. I used to be a, uh, a frequent caller on Dennis Miller's radio show, um, and his podcast a little bit. They didn't take a lot of live calls, but... Um, I've got a greatest hits on, on my YouTube channel. Um, and when a, when a national treasure like Dennis Miller laughs at your joke, I mean, that, that made my week. Um, yeah, that's a lot of fun. My dad was more of a, a vocalist, um, but he did theater and I was in some plays. And uh, I remember as a child, he would lay down with me with paper and a pen and we would draw clowns. And clowns were kind of a big deal with me when we were a kid. I remember going to the circus with my family and a little um, dwarf clown walked by and I said, there's Jimmy Armstrong. And my dad whipped around and said, how did you know his name? He hasn't been on yet. And I said, well, he was there last year. That's Jimmy Armstrong. Jimmy Armstrong was a big deal to me. Uh, I've always had a clown fetish and people are scared of clowns and that's because they've been bastardized in movies because kids trust clowns and okay John Wayne Gacy one bad apple but um, yeah I wanted to be a clown when I was a kid that's probably what led to the stand-up comedy and in college I did a series of caricatures that were based on uh, they were uh, caricatures of, of well-known comics got an Eddie Murphy and a Sam Kennison and so those were fun both um, I uh, have have been an artist since I was old enough to hold a crayon in my little hand but um, I was always interested in learning uh, I remember attending a workshop from a visiting artist at a really young age um, it might have been, I, I went to several things at the uh, Albright Kemper Museum of Art here in town. When I was in high school, our uh, art teacher recommended this little old lady that taught oil painting out of her uh, basement. And uh, we'd show up and she would pull out, oh, like the Bob Ross pictures or the Bill Alexander. I think it was more Bill Alexander because this was back in the 70s, or no, the 80s, uh, before Bob Ross really took off. Um, anyway, she would pull out these books and you would pick a landscape and put it up and sit and duplicate that stuff. So I remember I had one or two paintings from that class and my mom said, what do we do with these? Do we hang them on the wall? And I said, no, they, they went in the attic. I wasn't there to make a masterpiece. I was there to learn how to work with paint on a palette, how to mix colors, how to use medium. And uh, so to me, I was learning technique and what, what to do with a fan brush. And I don't do much with a fan brush anymore, but um, different brushes, different techniques and um, how to control the paint on a palette. So I learned all that and uh, it, was, it was fun and interesting, but no, the paintings didn't go on the wall from that class. Went to the University of Kansas. I, I shopped around and uh, 
my KU friends won't want to hear this, but I went to MU and uh, I said, I'd like to see your art department. And they said, well, we really don't have an art department. And I said, thank you. And I left. And uh, then I found out about the University of Kansas and that Hallmark at the time, I don't know, you know, what's going on now, but Hallmark pumped a lot of money into the curriculum. Um, and so um, it didn't take too long for me to decide on, on the University of Kansas. I had considered the Art Institute of Kansas City, but I wanted sort of the well-rounded college experience. Um, so I went, I went with KU and, and had a, a, a pretty good exposure to a lot of different uh, possibilities with art. So I, uh, I remember a trip to New York that we took that uh, was was a great. I got to see a lot of Rembrandts and and uh, and hear some uh, really uh, talented artists speak. Um, really enjoyed my uh, five years at the University of Kansas. Toward the end of my uh, studies at KU. As an illustration major, they offered us the opportunity to uh, to do portraits of musicians that uh, they featured on the cover of their local NPR programs that they had in the all the shops in Lawrence. And so the trade-off was: if you do the artwork for us, we'll give you all the unused printed covers, and they take them off. They call them tear sheets. And you know, before you had a website, that was how you got your art out to uh, potential uh, companies that would want to hire you to do work. So that I did two. One was Andre Segovia, which uh, I think turned out really nice, and um, the other was Beethoven. And so I got to looking at Beethoven. I couldn't find, I found out that he died obviously before photographs came about, so all there were were paintings from other artists of Beethoven. And I didn't want to paint off of their paintings, and so my solution was to find a model that resembled Beethoven. And so I'm, I'm talking to my roommate and I said, I need to find uh, a guy with a square jaw and a cleft chin and deep set eyes and a German nose and cheekbones about right here. And we just stopped and I went, wow, I guess this is gonna be a self portrait. And so I, uh, I got a shop light where we did some real dramatic lighting and I threw on a smoking jacket that I had from a fraternity pajama party and a, a, a white dress shirt and a scarf. And I tried to emulate the, the way they had the knot tied in the paintings and then I did that scowl that Beethoven makes and so my take was to listen to his music the entire time I painted the portrait and it gave it this stormy look that uh, that I felt when I when I listened to his especially the fifth symphony which everybody you know is his most famous work but everything had kind of a stormy quality to it so that came out in the painting and um, and then this high contrast light, which um, Rem Rembrandt's my hero, and that's called chiaroscuro, where it's modeled out of the darkness. And uh, that's, uh, I've mentioned Rembrandt two or three times. Yeah, he's, he's the guy that I try to emulate with very little success, but you know, he's my, he's my goal, he's my marker. And uh, so I got this modeled look and when it all came together, um, I put the pictures down from the other artists and tweaked the facial features back less like me and more like what what they perceived him to look like. And then um, and then it made the cover of uh, KANU, uh, their program. And uh, I submitted that not too long ago uh, to an art show, and it. It uh, hangs at the hospital here in town, and it was rejected by the judges because they said it might make people feel unsettled, and I didn't get that at all. Uh, I just thought it was kind of intense, but um, I, I, I didn't make it maniacal on purpose, but I, I just, he has 
this intense feeling I get when I listen to his music. So that came out intentionally. So I did two musician portraits for um, KANU Radio at uh, the University of Kansas. The second was Andre Segovia. And um, I found his photograph on a CD cover and it was lighted brilliantly. And I decided to use that as my source. So I listened to Segovia's music the entire time I painted that piece. And it really turned out to be um, the best thing I'd ever painted. And um, I used that for years not to paint anything else, really. Uh, now, part of it was after graduation, I didn't have a studio. And so I packed up my paints and it was my uh, one day I'll have a house with, a, with an attic that I can build a studio in. And uh, that took years and years and years. And the whole time I had that on the wall in my living room and it was the best thing I'd ever painted. And so it was a little intimidating. And one day, <clears throat> and this is after I began painting again, um, and I got my work online, I got a call from a lady and she had seen it online and she bought that painting. And so then I didn't have the best thing I'd ever painted in my life. I remember that day I was so torn. I never not wanted $2,000 so much in my entire life. She gave me full price and uh, it, it broke my heart to let go of it, but it was liberating at the same time. And it sort of challenged me to paint again. And uh, I've been going at it ever since. As artists, um, my, my influences, I, I'd have to say Rembrandt is my, uh, the artist that I, I like to emulate because his, um, he, he did a lot of self-portraits that you can just tell if that guy walked by, you would, uh, you'd recognize him. And likeness has always been a big deal with me, as well as Rembrandt, to me, paints like a sculptor. Uh, and I try and think like that too, how three-dimensional it looks because he's constantly modeling the images. And um, that's, that's what I try to pull from, from what I uh, observe with, with Rembrandt. Uh, and chiaroscuro is the modeling of, of the uh, form out of darkness. So um, there's a fine line between modeling something out of darkness and having it come off as a black velvet painting. We don't want that. But um, it's, uh, it's just one of my favorite things is to pull three dimension out of uh, out of darkness. I've done some sculpture. Uh, I really enjoy that. Um, what other? Uh, I think music is art, and I've always been a musician. Um, I'm a writer. I uh, and I've written some stand-up comedy, and I've performed that. I uh, did a little theater. I'd have to say most of it is uh, portraiture. I'm a portrait artist. I don't, I don't really want to limit myself uh, to be a portrait artist, but that's that's kind of my thing that gives me a buzz. I love to capture a likeness. Um, I'll do um, oil paintings. I'll do uh, caricatures at events. I uh, I just enjoy capturing a likeness of a person and um, I'll tell you one thing that when somebody asks me what I offer with my art um, one Christmas a couple years ago I decided to paint my uh, late grandmother my mom's mom for her for for my mother for Christmas and um, as the painting was coming together I was just kind of on autopilot and then I stepped back 
a good, uh, I don't know, three or four yards. I do that a lot when I paint because it looks a lot different when you step away from it. That's how it's usually viewed. And so I pulled back just to give it a glance and all of a sudden I was looking at my grandmother <laughs> and I teared up. And uh, if I can do that for other people, that's a, 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 a gift. Uh, it's, it's an honor, a pleasure for me to do for other people. It's, uh, it's what I enjoy about uh, painting, that I can share a moment with somebody else. I'd have to say portraiture. Uh, just about everything I do has people um, and capturing a moment in time. Um, even if it's a, a, a person sitting for a portrait, I try and find something about that person that shows up in the portrait. Like, like the music with Beethoven, uh, just the whole person and not just uh, a likeness. Um, I've fallen into a theme uh, when a buddy of mine bought a new house. He inherited some money when his mother passed away and he'd been collecting chief's paraphernalia and royal's memorabilia all his life. Everything's autographed. Everything's in a, a mounted case, uh, jerseys shoes, helmets, bobbleheads, anything you can think of. This friend of mine could open a museum in his basement and it would be uh, like, it wouldn't take much to have it declared an actual museum. And as this was coming together, he uh, was talking about what he was going to do at the place. And so I came over and checked it out. And I said, uh, you know, what you really need here is a mural. And he says, yeah, I've got a little place over here. And I thought maybe you could paint like a couple of players right over there. And I said, Bob, you've got this great big wall where you come down the stairs into your basement. And it's like 10 feet wide, seven or eight feet tall. And I said, why don't you set the tone right there? And he said, could you do that? And I said, yeah, I'm a portrait artist. And uh, he said, well, I, I wanna know what you charge. And I told him, and he said, I'm not gonna ask you for a special rate. And you know, I probably would have given him a special rate, but uh, God bless him for not uh, asking for a special rate. And so three years later, we had this mural finished. Um, I decided to open up Arrowhead stadium and the K because they're right next to each other so it kind of made it all one thing and we put the Royals on one side and the Chiefs on the other so about a year or a year and a half in was when Patrick Mahomes took the scene where he was the starting quarterback and he said I uh, I want to wait until the end of the season maybe the spring and then maybe we'll put Patrick on there I want to see how he does <laughs> And uh, so, you know, a few games in, it was apparent that Patrick was going to make the mural. So I photoshopped where he was going to go, and I sent my friend Bob uh, a mock-up, and he sent it to some friends, and one of them was a bar owner at uh, Johnny's on 7th in Kansas City, uh, and that happened to be the contact for a, a reporter from the New York Times who did a story on the 2015 Royals World Series. So he came to town and did that and he made these connections. And when Patrick blew up, they decided to send him back to Kansas City and do a, you know, since he already had a lot of KC connections and uh, used them to formulate a story on Mahomes mania. So somehow he contacted Chris at Johnny's on 7th and said, uh, I'm looking for a guy who is um, a fanatic. He's got a personal license plate. He's got everything autographed. He's got a whole man cave. And the guy said, just stop. I know who you're talking about. And he sent him Bob. And so Bob uh, 
gets a text and he thinks it's a joke. Yeah, right, New York Times, whatever. And finally the guy convinced him uh, that it was legit. And he said, I understand you have Patrick on your mural. And he said, no, Patrick's the next guy we're gonna have painted on the mural. And he said, well, we're coming to town Monday and that's kind of a deal breaker. And so uh, Bob said, let me make a call. So I get a call on Saturday night and Bob says, remember we were talking about painting Patrick on the mural? Yeah, think you can have that done by Monday? And I said, Monday, what time? He told, he told me the whole story about the, the article and how he wasn't gonna make it without the painting. And I said, what time? And he said, seven or eight o'clock at night. And I said, let me pack a bag. And so it was like a hostage situation. I, I was, first I watched the football game, the Chiefs game on Sunday. So that put us out at about five o'clock. I started painting and painted until midnight and then got up at the crack of noon the next day. And I painted until seven or eight o'clock, seven, 7.30 maybe, I'm pulling the blue tape off the mural and that's when the doorbell rang and the photog showed up. So it worked out barely. And uh, I told the photographer, I said, careful, it's wet. And it made the New York Times and so that was cool because the picture that they chose from Bob's extreme man cave was my mural and they gave me a name drop. So that was nice. Anyway, after the mural, I uh, decided I wanted to paint uh, a realistic portrait of Patrick because the mural was more of a caricature bobblehead kind of a thing where we blew the heads up to make them look comical. Um, so then I did a, a regular portrait, of, a realistic portrait of Patrick, and that took off. And between the two, I started to get a reputation as being a sports artist. And at first, I kind of, I was kind of worried about being Christopher Reeved into a category that I couldn't get out of. But really, I'm a portrait artist, and this is just uh, a genre that I'm fitting into. Um, and I enjoy it, it's fun, and uh, there's a community of artists that do fan-based art that they're really supportive. It's not competitive like you'd think, and uh, they're a great group to, uh, to trade ideas with, to uh, support each other, uh, and I'm involved in a show coming up with uh, sports artists. Uh, at first Friday on uh, October the 7th at Mod Gallery. It's uh, multiple sports artists that first Friday. Usually it's somebody that resonates with me. Um, that sounds selfish, but sometimes I end up painting heroes. I did a, com a comedy series, a stand-up comic series in college, and they were caricatures out of oil pastel but they still meant a lot to me. I'm, I'm a stand-up comedy junkie, and so it held my interest, and so I hope that shows through to uh, other people that view it. Just somebody that I think that I have interest with, uh, or that I'm interested in, just sort of how I perceive things. As the sports art that I've uh, started producing has caught on, I've gotten more uh, work out of that and I've done three murals and, uh, and then I continue to do more sports oriented painting because they're, they're just popular in this area. And um, I'd have to say the first painting I did of Patrick Mahomes is still my favorite. Um, I think it just, um, it captures his, his uh, essence better than anything so far. And I still enjoy, I enjoy painting him because he's such a positive person. And uh, it, it shows through what he's done. Uh, I love that he, the minute he showed up in Kansas City, he started doing philanthropy and uh, investing in, in the area. And uh, he's just an interesting guy with a hell of a lot of talent. And uh, in a way, I feel like I'm kind of giving back to you know, celebrate him.
Also, uh, I give away 10% of that painting when I sell a print to uh, Alzheimer's research because uh, it's uh, an issue that we're dealing with in my family and uh, so that's my, my chosen uh, charity to work with. When I pick a subject, I, uh, I do a lot of research on uh, photographs that reflect that person and, uh, and I'm interested in composition and likeness and so I uh, put a lot of thought into the, the uh, visuals that I use when I do the painting. A lot of times it's an amalgam of different photos um, and sometimes I'll take I'll, I'll Frankenstein some things together in Photoshop and work from that. I try not to think about how people will judge what I'm painting. I try and think about what I see in the subject and then it's about color choices and composition and, and uh, this reminds me of a story. In college you had to decide whether you were going to be in design or in fine art and at the time I thought being an illustrator was going to be more of a lucrative decision, more of a, a way to earn a, a steady income than uh, just hoping people would like my, my paintings. And so I chose the design path. But what I didn't care for was at the time, the two programs in the uh, art and design building were kind of at odds. As an illustration major toward the end of my college career, I started to plan paintings in my painting class. And I, and I took as many painting classes as I could, but I remember in the last painting class I took, we uh, were tasked with doing a still life. And the instructor, when we did our critique, he went right to mine and he said, uh, Mr. Fleck, is this uh, an illustration or is this a painting? And I immediately knew where we were going with this and it was an argument that I'd heard so many times. I was so tired of the discussion. And he said, is it a painting or an illustration? And I said, yes. And he said, what do you mean by that? And I said, well, it's a, a painterly illustration or it's an illustrative painting. And I said, if this were a bowl of fruit, I, I had chosen to do uh, a cheeseburger with fries and a beer, and I painted it just like I would have any other still life. But for my portfolio, it was something that you could maybe see in a, in a menu or whatever. And so I said, you know, if this were a bowl of fruit, we wouldn't be having this discussion, would we? I have one more KU story that I have to tell. We had a photography instructor and he was from China. And his name is Pak Chi Lao. I think he's still alive and I think he's still working. But his whole shtick was to ask homeowners in Johnson County and the surrounding area if he could come into their home and photograph it. And a lot of people were delighted that a famous photographer wanted to photograph their house. So he would, he would uh, spend his entire time finding humor in the way the house was decorated. He would come into your home and he would make fun of your decor. And where the pictures were hysterical, it made me wonder how he would feel if somebody did that to him. So the first assignment he gave us was a social commentary. And I went to every Chinese restaurant in Lawrence and I did it right back to him. And I decided he's either gonna love it or he's gonna hate it. And either way, I'm gonna make my point just like he made his. And so I rolled the dice and he called me in after class. And he said, Mr. Fleck, your darkroom skills 
are horrid. And I said, yeah, I know. He said, I can see lint on this picture and I can see uh, a little overexposure on this one. And I said, okay, but I want to tell you, I have been dying to do this since I got here and the Chinese community is so small and tight knit, I would have been ostracized. So thank you, thank you so much. I don't care about your dark, your dark room skills. I'm giving you an A for this project just because I love what you've done and we became friends. <laughs> My first video project was an audition tape for the Muppets. I started writing letters to uh, companies that I'd love to work with and one of them was the Muppets. Uh, when most little kids were learning their alphabet, I was trying to figure out how Big Bird's mouth worked. I, I wasn't, you know, I was in on the joke. And uh, I remember critiquing things when I was a kid, like uh, comedy albums. Uh, I, I remember uh, being cognizant of production and script and uh, things that little kids usually don't consider until they're much older. I decided in college to start launching promo packets to whoever, you know, whatever big job I'd like to land and I always thought the Muppets would be a good fit for me. And so I put um, an impression tape that I had, I did voices and I had famous people on one side of the cassette and on the other side was uh, a group of uh, cartoon characters and Muppets and I think that's where I might have gotten their attention. And so I sent artwork and I big long letter about how I'd always followed the Muppets, but you know, I'm sure they got a lot of that. So one day I came home from class and I had a message on my answering machine. It was from Henson Associates and they received my packet and they wanted to invite me to a special uh, invitation only Muppet workshop. And so I listened to it a couple of times to make sure I wasn't dreaming and I called my parents and my mom said, talk to your grandparents, they're looking for a, a graduation gift for you. And so they sent me $300 and I wrote a script and hired a guy in the radio TV department to uh, put together this audition tape and I bought fake fur and hot glue and ping pong balls and I wrote the script and backseat directed with this guy and put together the audition tape and um, made it made it there by their deadline and got an invitation and I got to meet Jim Henson uh, and his wife interviewed me one on one and uh, we were in a an isolated room and I could just feel that we were being recorded, his wife and I, and she had this box. And she slides a Muppet across the table and she says, put a voice to that one. And I said, okay, and I did. And slides another one and it's a monster, and I, you know, whatever. And then the third one, she slides Kermit across the table and says, put a voice to that one. And I said, I can't. And she said, why? And I said, you're Kermit's wife. And she said, give it a shot, this one's important. And looking back, I think maybe they knew he wasn't well before they announced it. And, or maybe they were just looking to delegate and he was wanting to slow down or get involved in film and less of the, the Muppet show and Sesame Street and that kind of thing. So um, anyway, spoiler alert, I didn't get the job, but it was a great experience that I'll never forget. So the Muppet audition was my first taste of video. So right out of college, I got a job at the ABC affiliate and started there in, uh, as a pr production assistant for the news department and uh, really enjoyed that. But I was there to try and get a job making commercials. And that eventually happened and I did that for about a year and then transitioned over to the cable company. And by that time, I had won some awards. Uh, I think my first commercial at the ABC affiliate won an award. 
And so I uh, had a reputation as an award-winning commercial producer and started handling my clients like I was their uh, small boutique ad agency. So I had kind of a system where I would uh, do a, a meeting, talk about their goals, and then come up with something fun and creative that would stick in people's minds. And, you know, I was a child of television, so this was a real uh, logical fit for me and my creativity. And uh, with my art background, I could show up and do storyboards. And in my local market, people weren't really used to that. So it was uh, fresh for them, exciting and fun for both of us. And uh, I was only gonna do that for a couple of years. And 30 years later, they closed my department down. <laughs> uh, and and uh, now I do it on my own. Right now I'm doing um, First Friday in Kansas City. That's where I show my work. Uh, in the past, I had uh, hung some uh, of my pieces uh, in conjunction with the local uh, Museum of Art and the hospital. The uh, Albright Kemper Museum of Art and Mosaic had a joint venture where uh, we would hang our pieces in the, in the hallways at the hospital. And uh, currently, I'm doing First Fridays in Kansas City. And uh, that's between those shows and my online gallery, uh, that's where I show my work. Uh, First Friday is pretty unique. Uh, you get a, a, a large spectrum of uh, attendees. The, the crowd's pretty diverse and uh, you can look at other artists too. And, and so I've, I've seen some things that kind of influence maybe what I'm gonna do next. Uh, you can always go to my website, chrisfleckart.com, and um, I'm always on Facebook and most social media. So anything that I'm, you know, if I have a work in progress or uh, some newer items, you can see those. Um, but my website is 24-7, and uh, you can always contact me on Messenger on Facebook. I really like to uh, represent my subject in, in a different way or, um, yeah, let's say a, a unique way. I, um, I'm worried about likeness. I'm concerned about likeness um, and maybe the emotions that that person brings to um, the viewer.
Thank you for joining us on Digital Profile Art of the Artist. I'm Jazzy Earl. To see more of Chris's work, look for the links listed below. We hope you have enjoyed our program, and if so, please hit the like and subscribe buttons as well as the bell notification.